Very good morning to all. It's always a privilege to be with you, not just a joy only, a privilege indeed. Well, the very title of our sermon today is God Makes No Mistakes. But I've got to be honest with you, the reason for that is that God makes no mistakes in what he's doing and how he's choosing and what he's accomplishing, but it's not exactly what we're going to be talking about. And for those of you who are watching on a recording today, we're going to have a family church meeting, so I'll probably shorten my remarks today. But I need to do this introduction, if you will, and, and an understanding of what is we're about to step into. Um, there's multiple reasons why these, ver these verses, these next three chapters are going to be really, really important. First of all, Preaching through Romans, if you understand Romans, if a church understands Romans, it develops leadership in the church. Romans is strong, solid doctrine that is essential for a church. Uh, and unfortunately, it seems to be overlooked by many evangelical churches because Paul is full of an argument for eternal life and for a secure eternal salvation. You don't sin a few times and then you lose your salvation. You've got to walk the, church, the aisle again. That's just, that's just, that's not, that's not biblical. But here in these, these next three chapters we're going to be uh, getting into, they're very unusual. As a matter of fact, there's Bible critics like uh, Walter Brueggemann in seminary, Paul. I called him Walter Boogerman. <laughs> Um, he criticizes Romans 9 through 11 as being arbitrarily placed in the letter to the Romans at some point, at some time. Uh, although he cast some doubt on Paul being the writer of Romans, uh, he never did deny that Paul's letter is the, uh, and that these chapters were added later, he says, but he never denied that Paul is the author. As a matter of fact, Paul, this is the one book that they don't doubt. I say the one book, there's actually others, but they don't doubt that, that Paul is, a, is the author of this. They do doubt that he is the uh, author of Hebrews, although I think he probably is. Rather, other biblical scholars uh, place uh, the book of Romans and these three chapters uh, in, in a very specific placement as rather an extension of Paul's discussion of his ongoing biblical doctrine that he, that he teaches us here in the book of Romans. Uh, more specifically, Bible supporters like Warren Wiersbe say that the chapter 9 is, a, is about Israel's uh, past election by God and the blessings for being a nation chosen by God. And then chapter 10 is about Israel's present and ongoing rejection of God's Son and Messiah. And then chapter 11 is about Israel's future restoration into the wild olive tree. So these chapters give insight into Israel's past and future. And although there are older countries like Egypt and, and Syria, uh, remember that no country has had its history recorded and publicized like Israel has. So Paul recognizes that the Jews started the new church. They've gotten it going. They are the heart of the new church. But it's going to be the Gentiles that are going to be inserted into, into the wild olive tree and are going to become God's banner bearers until near the end of times. And that's again when uh, Israel will be reinserted in the wild, wild olive tree. I'll mention that again in just a moment. I want you to join me now, please. I'm just going to read eight verses. One, verse uh, 1 through uh, 8 in chapter 9. I'm telling the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My, my conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart, that I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption as sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and of the temple service and the promises, who are the fathers and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. 
But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For they are not all Israel who has descended from Israel, nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. But through Isaac, your descendants will be named. That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. Now, in those last three verses, there's a lot of, of theology, and I'll touch, I'll get back to that next week. I, I need to make clear about this, uh, these three chapters and to introduce this, this chapters to you so that it will make sense. And so you'll know the overall setting of, of all of this. Uh, just so happens uh, that, that those who are with me on Wednesday nights, we are studying the attributes of God. And I've clarified that it's not the characteristics of God, like love, joy, peace, mercy, kindness, loving kindness, uh, light. Those are characteristics. Rather, God is, is omniscient. That's an attribute. He is omnipresent. He is immutable. He's unmovable, in other words. He's faithful. He is, he is all-knowing. He's all-wise in the other attributes. So in chapter 9, we're going to hear again how God has been faithful through the centuries with Israel. Now, he has chosen Israel among all the nations, and he's created them from Abraham and Abraham's chosen seed. And the reason I say that is because that Abraham had eight sons, including Ishmael. But it was Isaac. In Isaac's descendants that God created and blessed to become the nation of Israel. And unfortunately, you know that Israel disregarded God over and over. And then God would come in and punish them, but always forgive them. And he would show his attribute of faithfulness to them. Yet, of course, they would continue to choose idols to worship instead of God. And then the cycle would repeat over and over. You know that story. In, in chapter 9, though, Paul is going to show the faithfulness of God, repeating his mercy and forgiveness over and over to the Jews. So this is kind of, this is kind of the, the situation. We remember how exciting the end of, of chapter 8 was? Well, all of a sudden here in chapter 9, it's, it's kind of a harsh tone. It, it just totally is different that Paul has begun here. And so that puzzles some people. But we have to remember that Paul is facing execution, and so he is kind of on a strict mission here. He's, he's pushing forward, trying to do his best to bring these group of Jews and these group of Gentiles who have been called heathens and so forth throughout history, to bring them together and meld them together so that they become one group. So Paul is feeling a little short in time, but he's also trying to help the Jews understand they're going to be taking the back seat because of their continued rejection. Instead, the Gentiles will be the banner bearers of the gospel for a period of time before God reinserts the Jews back into the wild olive tree. And of course, we know on this side of Revelation what is going to happen during what we refer to as the end times. So Paul begins to testify of the attributes of God, such as the faithfulness, the righteousness, the justice. The, the grace of God in dealing with Israel, his chosen nation. And I, and I want you to take a look as we are understanding what these three chapters are going to teach us. Look over at, at verses 18 through 21. Did I put those up? Good. 18 through 21, now begin. So that, we, so that he has mercy on whom he desires, and he, and he hardens whom he desires. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault for who resists his will on the contrary who are you O man who answers back to God the thing molded will not say to the molder why did you make me like this will it or does the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use now quite frankly that, those, those uh, three verses right there are so deep that I can make a sermon out of just them. 
So in our shortened time today, I, I, I want to take a, just a few moments to put before you these two parties and help us to understand as we begin these, these three chapters, because these three chapters are a big deal. God has wonderfully blessed both the Jews and the Gentiles in choosing them. First of all, if you look at the Hebrews or the Jews, God created the, the Hebrews from one of the eight sons of Abraham. And he saw them through a terrible slavery to Pharaoh, who did not recognize Joseph and his people. And God brought them out of slavery with gold and silver, and then they had to fight against such major superpowers as the Hittites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, and so many others, including the Ammonites. And they won. The only time they lost, the only time they began falling back is, is when they were disobey. When they obeyed God, God would, would take care of them. But when we sin, God has to intervene, doesn't he? He has to get our attention back on him. So through Israel, God established a kingdom whom he has brought the Messiah, our Savior, not only to the Jews, but to all of mankind. Yet the Jews have continued to reject Jesus as the Messiah. And even to this day, they continue to reject Jesus as the Messiah. Therefore, the, as we read through these three chapters, we're going to understand that God has broken off the limbs of the wild olive tree. He's placed us as Gentiles in their place. And, and quite frankly, that's an honored place. That's a very honored place that we have, Sandy, that, that, he, has, that he has brought us not only into his kingdom to receive eternal life, but now, Sandy, we're to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth and to carry his banner high for him. Yeah. Look on the screen. I've got some things I need to tell you. This first one is about a coach being fired. No longer is being a Christian an honor thing. Even thugs used to tone down their language back in the 50s and 60s and so forth. They would tone down their language and their rhetoric around older, older Christians and pastors. Uh, that seems to be a thing of the past now. So that's not coming up. Now, the good news is, look at the, the October the 27th, that coach was reinstated. But this, was a, this happened like two to three years ago had to go to the Supreme Court to get him back his job because he was fired for putting a knee down on the, on the football field and praying. Go to the next one, please. This next one represents you and I. Now people are being fired for being a Christian. Now people are being considered suspect for believing in God and praying. Now the media has picked up the assault on Christians as well as companies like Disney, which of course used to be safe places for us to go for entertainment and to watch for TV. This uh, web, web page, if it comes up, is about an employee who was fired from, from CBS for speaking the name of Jesus. I wonder if, they'd have, if they would have fired them for speaking the name of Allah. Or speaking the name of Buddha. I don't think so. It's not going to come out. Go to the next one then. The actor. Places like Disney, even Dallas County government, as I can tell you for sure. New York, Oregon, California, Vermont, and so many other places are no longer friendly or tolerant to Christians. And this is just one of many uh, blacklisted uh Actors that have been uh, blacklisted because they're Christians. Go to the next one, please. This one again is very much us. Church family, we are living in what is referred to as a postmodern world, which is more increasingly becoming anti Christian and suspects people. Who, who declared that an abortion is not a right of a woman or any of anyone. I want to wait a moment. I want this to come up. I want you to see this. 
This is about a Vermont girl that was initially banned from the locker room because she didn't want to change in front of a boy that identified himself as a girl. That's all the girls, the volleyball team. This, this one boy identified as a girl, so she didn't want to be changing in front of him. And they banned her for being hate, for hate. And then they suspended her. Now, I don't know the end of that story. I don't know if she's been reinstated. I don't, I don't know that. I just know that she was initially banned and then she was suspended. It's not going to come up? That is amazing. You said the delay. Uh, it's taking it a while. Yeah, it's too long. we got to go. Go to the next one on the abortion pictures. All of these signs that the abortion people hold up, I'll give you a moment just to look at that. This is on auto, so I can't really stop. They hold up these signs. Uh, my body, my choice. My uterus, my choice. Don't make laws to control my uterus. Those kinds of things. You know, if, they, if, if something is in their body, then they think they have the right to, to cast it out like it's a cancer. My suggestion to them would be to make that choice before you get pregnant. But they think they have the right to, to kill a baby. That first thing that you saw was that if you kill an eagle, you're fine. Or a large amount of money. If you kill... Well, you know, if any of you watch uh, Lone Star Law, Suman, you know that you get fined for getting too many redfish. You get fined for getting too many of this. Or... You get fined for not having a deer that's 12 inches across in antlers. It may be an eight point or 10 point deer, but if it has narrow antlers, you can't shoot it. But you can kill a baby and people applaud you. And they showed pictures of, you remember a man that killed a lion? He was a dentist, remember he had to move? Somebody killed a gorilla? And the world came down on them. But you kill a baby. And people in New York give you out of boys, out of girls. Yeah. And I statement to you is that the, if you remember, and all of you do, uh, Dwight, I hope that you still got to hear that, that back in the day when we started the football game, somebody, the local pastor, the school board member even, would pray before we started a ball game. Do you remember that? Government meetings, people at work, even speaking the name of Jesus in school is now being quickly overcome by atheists and non-Christians who suspect Christians and their political agenda. And I don't think it's a stretch of the imagination to predict that perhaps before the end of the next decade that churches are going to be taxed and the name of Jesus will be considered a hate word in schools. Even now, in certain places, talking about uh, things in the Bible, such as homosexuality or, or transgender, will get you in trouble. And now, and, 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 <coughs> let, me, let me say this, I, just in case somebody says, oh, you're talking about the sovereignty of God. You know, I'm not predicting anything that's against the sovereignty of God. It's his knowledge and his understanding that Satan is going to win in this world for a period of time. God knows it, and he's told us through John and Peter and other apostles and writers of the, of the gospel that this is going to happen. But what a blessing we have had as Christians that we've had the chance to reign strongly and be his better bear bearers, and we still can be. I'll have the privilege in, in representing you in Africa in four months. There, by the grace of God, I'll, I'll have the chance to share the gospel with hundreds of people who, by God's blessing and the Holy Spirit's movement, will become Christians and know Jesus as their Savior. But I want to begin to conclude this morning to say this. While we have time, we must invite people to Jesus and to our church. While we have time, we must continue our witness for Jesus. 
I've never asked you guys to get in anybody's face and be confronted to them. And I've never asked you that every time you stand in line, anywhere, anyhow, you begin talking to people all around you and you witness to them. I've never asked you to do something like that. What I would say is to let the Holy Spirit guide you. But if you will begin a lifestyle of praying for people and being kind to people and to offer them, have a blessed day as you leave them, or speak about Jesus for just a moment. I know for a fact that all kinds of doors will begin to open for you. And it will become a pattern or a lifestyle that will be easy for you to do. It just will. We need to get people in church. We need to get people to hear the, a kind word from us. And, and hopefully even a blessing to their day or their weekend. They need to hear kind words from us. That God has given to us the privilege of sharing in this, in this world. Because there's coming a day in this Gentile world that there are powers to be that are going to quieten us by threat, perhaps by jail. And then God will give the blessing back to the Jews and reinsert them into the wild olive tree. But you and I, church family, have been adopted as a child of God. So my, my, my encouragement to you is to act like a child of God, not only in our behavior, not only in our speech, but in our inviting people to church or our speaking up for Jesus. Okay? I know we can't quiet everything. I know, I know as a matter of fact, there is an uh, a, a, a interview that I saw last week that this group of people that I would name were working, they said specifically they've been working closely with Hollywood to bring about an agenda of, of negative words and negative things on TV that you and I are offended by, but that Hollywood is helping them to project in their in their movies in their TV shows. And we know that, don't we? Even, even decent shows that, that have no reason to have bad words in them. Bad words are showing up. While we have time, let's continue to serve God wherever we are. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We're so grateful that your loving kindness has given us hope and understanding. But in all honesty, Father, we, we kind of need some encouragement. We, we, we need some impetus to, to be able to step forward and to pray and to, and to speak the name of Jesus. Not to offend people. Not to intentionally challenge people. But just to let them know that, you're, that we're different because... Jesus has changed us. So thank you, God, for that help and encouragement and blessing. Thank you, Lord, that as we invite people, they would respond. Thank you for letting us have the privilege to serve you. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.